We have quite the show tonight uh, on the latest episode of Indie Scene. Uh, we have a bunch to talk about. Uh, at, at the centerpiece of it is a movie called Norte uh, from the Philippines, directed by Lav Diaz, a filmmaker that I'm not familiar with, but uh, definitely want to know more after seeing this four hour and 10 minute epic, which confession time, I did not watch in one sitting. I spaced it out over the course of a week at Marathon the End sometime around uh, four o'clock this morning. And what an end it was. So mm -hmm. Sejiwa, <laughs> before we launch into that, uh, we've got a bunch of topics to go through uh, involving the uh, independent film scene, uh, this movie, and also your movie, The Secret Society for Slow Romance, which uh, 2022 is going to be the year of The Secret Society for Slow Romance. So what's That's going right. on with that? What's going on with the film? I'll talk about all that. Um, I got the old man look today, but I'll <laughs> shave when I do the next uh, Slow Romance podcast. You almost look like uh, like Sir Wok Wok uh, from the <laughs> from the film. You got that distinguished kind of beard. I like it. Who's that? Who's Sir Wok Wok? He was the uh, the cell the cell boss oh, right. that, in the in the right, prison. Right, right. Yeah, we'll talk all about him. <laughs> but uh, yeah, go ahead. That's right. Yeah, I didn't watch everything. I skipped through some parts. So. <gasps> it's okay. blasphemy. It's blasphemy. Okay. So when it's a four hour movie, if you see at least half of it, that's fine. Oh, wow. Okay, we're going to talk about that, but go, but, but go ahead. I read, but I read up on it extensively, so I know all the details. And uh, also, I didn't like Norte that much. So Whoa. We'll, we'll okay, this will this is going to be a good one. All right, let's talk about it. Let's talk all about right, Slow Romance first. Right, Slow Romance. Uh, slow Romance and then uh, film distribution changes and then we'll go to Norte. Yeah. So, well, I think those, uh, the first two topics are kind of related or intertwined. <clears throat> because of the new COVID variant breaking out, indie theaters and festivals kind of don't know what they're doing a few months down the road. Mm -hmm. And audiences are not showing up to even mainstream movie movies like they used to. Um, I heard today that, um, Spielberg's uh, West Side Story is uh, expected to make about $10 million when it opens, but the projections based on previous numbers was 100 million. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I'm not a math genius, but that sounds like a 90% drop in, uh, you know, possible money that would be taken in because a lot of people are afraid and are not coming out to the theaters. And uh, I went to a uh, to see an art house movie on a Monday a couple of weeks ago, right after the new variant was announced, and um, this was a uh, con selected award winning movie, hundred percent on Rotten Tomatoes for critics. There was like ten people at the movie theater, so uh, yeah, indie film never was never doing well money wise mm -hmm. uh, at theaters. And this is just not doable at this level, unless it's a special event like Max Holler Seist does special events where they sell out. But you know he has a following, and those are really uh, well planned events. But you know regular movie theaters are not doing well. Indie, indie movie theaters are not doing well. Mainstream movie theaters are not doing well. Festivals are hedging their bets. Uh, some are showing their entire slate that's uh, slated for movie theater uh, real world screening also online in case uh, you know the COVID variant shoots up and everything has to be shut down. So really tough year to plan out distribution because you need at least three months if you're gonna do uh, film screenings just to promote and line up things and make sure people get there, blah, blah, blah. So I've decided uh, since a lot of things are up in the air, a lot of my theaters can't commit to something at the moment even if they do commit, I don't even know if they'll be open. So I don't want to spend a whole bunch of money and effort to get people out to theaters, but you know, there may not be theaters you know, in spring that can show movies. Who knows? Everything's up in there. Feel free to, feel free to interrupt me while I'm- <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm just, I'm listening. I'm, take, I'm, I'm making notes, but uh, yeah, okay. go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm going on my rant because it's a lot of information. So that's one situation that's, where some things are. Tough to make distribution plans with mm -hmm. theaters and festivals. Uh, so, uh, 
some major festivals said no to the movie, but there's one major festival that is considering it. I heard from them. They haven't made a final decision yet. So that might still happen in early March. We'll see. Um, so I told the festival, let me know by end of December, but I'm gonna set up to do a thing called the Year of Slow Romance, which is mar promoting the movie every day, 10 blog posts, ads to a thousand people, et cetera, et cetera. There'll be a whole, there'll be a whole post about all the details. But basically uh, making the film's presence well known every every day for a whole year. So just to keep give people something positive, have some positive stuff on uh, social media, uh, because I think uh, we're heading we're headed for a tough year, maybe tougher than 2020 because 2020 people thought thought uh, oh in three months it'll be over, six months uh, it'll be over. I don't think so. I think we're in for another year of uh, at least battling with COVID and it might get worse uh, as the new variants break out and blah, blah, blah. So I think people will need something upbeat so to, uh, to keep, keep things going. So the year of sl a slow romance is happening. So either uh, promotional activities every day starting January 1st, plus the movie being available through uh, my website, uh, website for the movie Vimeo VOD and Eventive and any other outlets down the road as a new release, so it'll be priced a little bit higher, but still very affordable. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, that if that festival I'm hoping for comes through, then the movie will start screening in like early April. Uh, if it doesn't come through, if I don't hear from them by the 29th, um, uh, we're gonna start showing it starting the 29th uh, for some, for uh, Jamie Todd's uh, medium followers and then starting December, uh, starting January 1st for everyone. Mm. And uh, we'll do, uh, new release um, availability, then we'll do Q and A's, virtual screenings. So this, the, so the positive spin, uh, the positive side of this is I see this as an opportunity for indie filmmakers like, like myself to, to really build uh, indie film distribution in a way that makes sense for us because we can make movies fast, but we have to wait months to hear from festivals. Theatrical runs happen one or two weeks. They lose money. The you know again we have to wait for that. So if we can set up a thing where I finish a movie and within a couple of months I can have it up on the web and a few thousand people can see it and there's enough press coverage, then I can make and release a movie every few months. That would be much better for uh, indie filmmakers uh, like myself who do micro budget stuff, who have a lot of stories to tell and who can make movies fast. Mm -hmm. So that's what's going on with slow romance and distribution as a whole. I think a lot of fest a lot of theaters and uh, maybe even festivals may have to close down if things don't turn around fast in 2022 because they were already losing money and they lost a lot of money in 2020 and 2021. Now we're going into the third year. So it looks bad for Film, uh, for uh, theatrical indie film in the real world. Yeah, I mean that's a lot. Um, How does that sound? Is that a is that a uh, uh, take that makes sense? No, <laughs> I mean I I understand that point of view. Um, I just don't know that it's borne out by recent numbers. Mm -hmm. um, you look at a movie like, uh, well, there's been a lot of talk about, well, I guess in the last few months, the narrative of, well, this movie came out and it made X number of dollars. That's good for, you know, we're in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But then you get, and especially when you had, especially the case of the Warner Brothers movies that were doing simultaneous releases to HBO Max, mm -hmm. uh, and then like Disney Plus and stuff it would get fuzzy because you'd say, well, this movie came out and it made $50 million, which is pre-pandemic times pathetic for something that cost, you know, $100, $250 million to make and then market and all that. But it was also simultaneous release. So it was very popular on these other services, but we could never quite get a look at, you know, those numbers and the algorithms and what that meant. So it was all right. kind of cryptic. But then you had uh, Venom, <laughs> Let There Be Carnage, which came out and made a hundred million dollars in its opening weekend. 
which Mm -hmm. nobody expected. And, you know, I was kind of baffled by it because I don't think it's a very good film. But you've had a string of films that have come out. And again, they're not doing as well as they probably would have pre-pandemic, but Mm -hmm. they're blowing past a lot of the pandemic era numbers i mean even the eternals which is a film that uh, a lot how is the bo- overall box office for hollywood movies uh to this year compared to 2019 i mean it's not good but i mean 2019 we weren't dealing with the pandemic so right, what right, I'm, right. so, so no. i'm saying they need to to function theaters need to do 2019 level numbers for hollywood right movies. right and you know i don't think that's going to happen but what i'm saying is the theaters are i i can't speak to the indie scene which is right. ironic because we're on a <laughs> series called indie scene yeah. but i did some well, research i'll i'll share information but no i'm what i'm saying is the you know we're in a weird time right now i can't you know no one can predict 2022 but right. if you look at say spider-man no way home mm-hmm. which is selling out everywhere mm-hmm. and there's talk that that could be you know globally the first, you know, billion dollar pandemic movie, which, you know, I don't know if it's going to get that big because you're talking about Avengers Endgame numbers and that was 2019. Mm -hmm. But, you know, people are, I mean, I've been going back to movies, you know, to Mm -hmm. catch films, you know, especially in this, uh, you know, award season and a lot of stuff's coming out. I've been, you know, slowly getting back to theaters and they Mm -hmm. haven't been ghost towns. You know, they've been crowded. There've been people in there, you know, kind of unafraid of, you know, pandemic concerns. You don't want to get too much into Omicron, but, you know, there's a lot of discussion about this variant being, if you're going to catch COVID, this is kind of the one to get, because even the doctors who discovered it said, yeah, mm-hmm. it's a variant of the coronavirus, but it amounts to, you know, it, you're not going to get hospitalized. No one's died from it yet. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we, we're still, yeah, it's early days on this stuff. But mm-hmm. my point is, things are not that bleak in terms of the mainstream theaters. Now, whether or not what they're doing now is enough to sustain them, that's a completely different question. But instead of a movie coming out like Ghostbusters, Afterlife, that movie came out and made $44 million. Mm -hmm. People are saying that was a smash hit, but the pre, you know, a couple months before it came out, the projections were, oh, this is going to make $100 million. This is the one that's bringing people back to theaters. And it was on the tail of the Venom. They're thinking, well, if the you know cut rate Spider-Man villain movie can make $100 million, surely the, the Ghostbusters sequel, this beloved 40-year-old property, is going to blow all that away. Mm-hmm. Uh, the estimate just before opening day plummeted to $30 million. The studio is like, we're going to make $30 million on this thing. It made forty-four, And so the headline became it blew past everybody's expectations. It's a massive hit. No, it's a $44 million opening on probably a hundred million plus budget with expectations. That it was going to be one of the big box office saviors. I mean, the Eternals, a movie nobody liked made 73 when it opened, mm-hmm. you know? So my point is things are up in the air, but I think it's way too soon to predict the death of movie theaters, because, you know, from what I've seen on the ground and with your, if you're looking at box office numbers, I don't think West Side Story making $10 million is an indication of people afraid of Omicron. I think it's an indication that people don't give a shit about West Side Story, no matter how much, you know, press and publicity and critics love it. You know, it's a, almost a three hour, you know, musical. We've had a number of musicals this year and most of them have bombed. People just don't care. Now, when okay, Spider-Man, so- Spider-Man, when that comes out, you know, if that does the kind of business that we're thinking and it does repeat business, I think you're going to have to re-examine the narrative. And again, this does not at all reflect anything going on in the the uh, the art house theater yeah. scene. Got it. So the uh, a few movies, few Hollywood mo- movies making a ton of money is not enough. 2019 box office total in the U.S. was 11 billion. Mm-hmm. 2020 box office total in the U.S. was 2 billion. So unless rent is frozen or rent is reduced, uh, the theaters uh, really can't lose eight billion, no, $9 billion a year. Or, uh, you know, they get like maybe 40% of that. Uh, you, know, you know, they can't lose their cut of $9 billion and stay open. I don't know what the numbers are in 21 because we're not done with 21 yet, but we're right. close enough. So we can look those numbers up. Yeah. Uh, uh, one uh, one movie 
like even 10 Hollywood movies making doing really well is not enough because you gotta, they have to pay rent every, you know, uh, every month. So right, that's but, at I mean, level. but we've been going through this pandemic for almost two years now, and you have not seen this, the shuttering of movie theaters that you would expect. I mean, there's been more than enough time for things to catch up. Movie, mm -hmm. A number of movie theaters were closed, you know, temporarily as they mm -hmm. figured, tried to figure everything out and, you know, different state mandates and things like that. But now things are, you know, back and, you know, not bigger than ever, but mm -hmm. things yeah. are trending up in terms of audience participation. Yeah, I think a lot of the movie, a lot a lot of the large movie theater companies are re have restructured financially and are running on debt, uh, hoping that in the future it'll even out. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, we'll have to research that anyway. That's Hollywood. So let's move yeah. on to the indie world. Indie world was never fully. Indie theaters were never fully financed through ticket sales. They were their art houses. Uh, they have calendars, they have subscriptions, they have uh, grants, they have other ways of, you know, staying, staying open, but their numbers have gone down significantly. So I'm not sure, I mean, we'll have to uh, get actual numbers and see who's, you know, close to closing, who's reopening. Uh, but just having, just trying to get my movie out and talking to film theaters, uh, it doesn't look good, just broadly speaking. It doesn't look good for indie theaters, but we'll see. I mean, everything could change drastically in two months, right? But yeah, I mean, it, it also, doesn't look good. Well, it could also be that, I mean, it depends on, you know, what cities you're talking about, how many art house theaters are in a city. I mean, it could be, I'm not saying I want this to happen, but it might be right. if there's a major metropolitan area that has six art house theaters, maybe they go down to two. Yeah. because of geography because of demand because i mean some of this also falls yeah. on the theaters themselves you know like yeah. if you look at the music box in chicago during the pandemic when things were at their their darkest they figured out a way to have drive-in movies mm -hmm. not on premises but you know they they worked it out they were like this drive-in movie sponsored by the music box uh they would have like they had this like a garage sale <laughs> kind of a thing where people they people would come in and buy you know, bits of memorabilia and stuff when, you know, social distance and masks and all that. So they got creative and engaged. They did like a whole online streaming service thing. So theaters, especially indie theaters, I think they actually have an advantage because they don't right. have to deal with a giant superstructure like AMC or Regal. They right. can get creative and do as much as they can to engage and, you know, keep this community active and supporting them, which I think is, is kind of exciting. I don't want to yeah. see anybody close, but I think that you know, to say that indie theaters are, you know, in danger of going away, I think that's a bit premature. Okay, I mean, that's it's just what I, it's not, I'm not, um, I'm not making a value judgment on it. I'm just calling it based on what things look like right now. I don't, I don't want any theater to close or any business remotely related to film to go under, but it doesn't look good for indie theaters, but we'll see. Uh, some, uh, those ones that have switched uh, into being nonprofits are doing better because uh, you know they gave up the whole idea of trying to profit, uh, trying to run it as a for-profit business. Now they have different ways of financing and thinking about the long-term health of the theater. So let's see what happens. Maybe uh, the ones that survive will become nonprofit art houses. I, can you explain a bit about how that works if they become a nonprofit? What does that mean as far as being a movie theater that means uh they have they can go for grants that are available for nonprofits. their tax the their tax burden is different i mean i i've never run a nonprofit art house but this is just by, this is just the basic stuff i know and their fundraising strategy is different it's not investors it's foundations that you know that support the arts and the governments uh, local and national uh, and uh, because it's a nonprofit, they rely more heavily on uh, their customers, uh, you know, and supporters. So it's, it's an entirely different model. Whereas if you are a for-profit theater, you have investors or you have the owner, and uh, your any money you make is taxed differently. There's a, so there's a significant tax advantage to being a nonprofit. 
or not for not for not for profit. Well, I mean, uh, I guess because it's it sounds like it's more of a like a legal financial distinction because I mean financial. Okay, but I mean, like if, but let's just say we'll use the music box as just an example, and and none of us, neither of us, have any information that the music box is going to become a nonprofit or anything. We're just using this right. as an example. Right, 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 right. Let's just say they become a, a nonprofit. They're still a movie theater. They're still selling tickets and popcorn and, and operating business as usual. It doesn't affect the day to day, right? So, what yeah. happens to? Uh, okay, so they can go for millions of uh, dollars in funding through foundations, governments local and national and individuals, because they, they also become a donation. If it's an individual, like for example, uh, music, uh, I know uh, Film Forum received uh, maybe a number of people gave them five, around 500,000 each as donations. Okay. So that's half a million from like, uh, you know, per person, maybe five people did that. So those are tax, deducti tax deductible donations. So. If you're wealthy, you can donate to a nonprofit and get a big tax break. So that's really good for the nonprofit. So having an extra 500 million, no, extra 500,000 or 2 million makes a difference for a small business like an art house theater. Right. So I guess the difference, if I understand this, is they don't have to rely they, on ticket sales to survive. Right. But I mean, like if I give, Five hundred thousand dollars to a struggling movie theater that's a nonprofit. Yes. And let's say three years from now, by some miracle, COVID and everything is over and things get back to normal and theaters start thriving again. And then my theater once again becomes profitable and it's like making you know two million dollars a year. If that's you know, oh, just make a number up. Yeah. Then because it's a nonprofit, I don't have any obligation to pay that $500,000 back because it was essentially a charitable grant on behalf of whoever gave that money? Yeah. Okay. And uh, if a nonprofits can make a profit, it just has to go back. I mean, you know, no one should listen to us about- <laughs> Yeah, this isn't financial <laughs> advice. We're just- Nonprofits <laughs> operate. This right. is our vague understanding. Yeah, yeah. Nonprofits can make a money, but a significant portion of that has to go back to the business. Right. So I guess my question is like, if say things go really well, right. then, you know, five years from now they're making $6 million and they have right. like, you know, it's $4 million of profit because everyone loves going right. to see indie movies. They've said, screw Marvel. We're just going to go see slow romance for the 90th time right. uh, at the music box. Yeah, that's uh, the best way to go. Right. So they have this $4 million. It has to go back into the theater. Right. So it's just like, everyone's going to get like deluxe seating and, you know, those rumble 4DX chairs to watch you know my dinner with andre <laughs> or or they'll save it as a long term like a lot of museums and nonprofit art institution institutions has a um, i forget the exact term not an endowment but there's a long-term fund that has millions of dollars that will enable them to function for x number of years i see so, so, so it, that fund keeps growing as opposed to say a for-profit traditional business yes where that $4 million profit would get split up as like bonuses among shareholders. And, right. you know, the CEO, since he steered the ship, he gets a million dollar golden parachute or something like that. It's right. more, or, it's more business. It's more, as you're putting it to the longevity of longevity of the business itself. Right. Um, if the thing you're doing that's arts related and that's community related is not making a lot of money, Switching to a nonprofit art model may be the best way to go. Hmm. Uh, as opposed to if the thing you're doing, like you have a music venue that makes money every night, then switching to a, a nonprofit model would be would not be good for you because that limits how much money you can make in the future. Hmm. Hmm. It's it's interesting. I mean, well, I think we should put a pin in this conversation and revisit it uh, next December. See where things are at. That's um, right. Oh, one more thing about Slow Romance. Uh, there's going to be a big group panel show. The 29th, I think there'll be like 10 people on it. Uh, the entire cast and crew, three people. <laughs> and uh, my girlfriend, Amanda, who's a producer on uh, on the movie because she helped out for two years you know, on it. She'll be on it sharing her views. And we'll have Jamie Toth, who's the, who's the number one fan of the movie. Mm -hmm. She's written like... Uh, three long articles about the movie so far. We'll have a bunch of other people. 
So I'll, I'll post up more information on my Twitter. And um, so hopefully that'll happen and it'll come out on January 1st and the movie will start, uh, people can start renting it starting January 1st from slowromancemovie.com. Yeah, that's great. We'll yeah. see. We'll update. Uh, nope. by, by the first. No, hopefully this is going to happen. You're going to, you're putting this out there. You're, you're laying the groundwork. No, no, either way. I mean, the only uh, unknown factor is if this one festival says we want to, we want to show the movie, then I have to hold off because the festivals right. don't yeah. like it when you're showing your movie and they have to show it also. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that would suck, but it would also be great. <laughs> It'd be great. Yeah, yeah. Either way, either yeah. way, slow romance wins. It's romantic. It'll be out. Either January 1st or April April 2nd or so. Yes. Well, let's talk about uh, another, another very romantic movie. That's right. <laughs> All right. So this is this is interesting. Uh, had you, I take it, you had not seen Norte before we discussed it. I have not seen it, no. Okay. Because usually these are things that you're recommending to me that you are, uh, well, are you familiar with Lav Diaz's other work? And how yeah, does this I've fall seen... in line with it? Well, a lot of his movies I've seen bits and pieces because they're so long. Mm -hmm. And I saw a short film I made that he made. It's really good. It's like three minutes long. Oh. And it was it was great. And uh, but I know about Love Diaz. I've I've, uh, I've read about him. He and you know seen interviews with him. He's a superstar in the indie film world. Kind of kind of like Apichat Fong versus Equal, who did uh, uh, Uncle Boon Me. Yeah. yeah. So he's from the Philippines. He was discovered by European film festivals and he's been on a roll for about 10 years now, putting out these six, seven, eight hour movies, sometimes four hours. Because when you first pitched this to me, I think you you had said it was like seven and a half hours long and I was all in for that. Um, <laughs> but then yeah. it turns out there was some kind of mistake. It was only, only four hours and 10 minutes. When you said that you made an amazing short film, I was like, oh, what is it? Two hours long. <laughs> but yeah. um, so, but this is different because usually the films we talk about are things that you've recommended to me, oftentimes things that you've seen and right. things that you really, you know, like and want to discuss, but you did not care for Norte. No, I thought, uh, I saw, I, I wrote a little uh, review of it on Twitter. I thought it was, it's long, slow, obviously, and it's dark you know the you know people doing evil things you know uh inept you know people being crushed by poverty there are some beautiful moments in there in the prison and uh in the resilience of people the mm -hmm. you know the, the the reunion after the guy gets out of prison but overall i thought it was a dark movie and uh, also philosophically kind of dark because they're saying i mean the movie is saying uh, you know, there, you know, there's like a million options uh, on to how to live your life. This guy chooses, you know, probably one of the worst options. He tries to demonstrate that uh, previous ideas, political and philosophical, are not no longer valid. He has total freedom, so he decides to do some horrible things. That's, you know, only crazy people do that. <laughs> the sane people, uh, when they realize you know, you know, their life is, you know, there's no restrictions, they can do whatever they do, they tend to choose the positive things. Hmm. If you want to live and not get, you know, not end up in prison and not die. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, I mean, well, that but that all that all comes with restrictions. I mean, <laughs> right, right. But, but I'm saying if there's no judgmental God, and if there is no, uh, if the power of the state is not absolute and it, but it's something that comes from the people, then constructive, healthy individuals who realize that both religion and uh, government are human constructs. So then that gives them uh, you know more freedom to do positive things if they want to, as opposed to saying, oh, I, my fate is limited by the government and and God. Yeah, well, I I mean, that's that's an entire like conversation unto itself. But I mean, that also assumes that everybody is kind of starting from the same base uh, mental health and assumptions and upbringing as far as, you know, what to do when you don't have certain constraints. Right. Um, it depends on like the values you were raised on. You know, some people right. would say, so, uh, hey. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm saying I don't like the decisions this guy made. 
No, no. And I, I don't either. I think we should probably back up and, you know, let people know what the hell we're talking about in case they haven't seen Norte, which came out in 2013. Well, um, summary. All right. Uh, I will read the summary from IMDb because that's sure. the best way to, to encapsulate a four hour and 10 minute movie. Yeah. Uh, an embittered law student commits a brutal double murder. A f- uh, how would you rate Norte the end of history? Sorry, I got a pop up on my IMDb. <laughs> don't prompt me to rate. Uh, yeah. A family man takes the fall and is forced into a harsh prison sentence. A mother and her two children wander the countryside looking for some kind of redemption. I don't know about this redemption thing. That's a weird turn of phrase. Yeah, um, they're just trying to survive. Right. Uh, so it is. And I I love this movie and I don't I do what? Well, I don't agree with the, you know, the politics of it. I I do feel that it is a very dark and a brutal and at times hard to watch, not only because of the violence, but also because of some of those. And I'm very disappointed. You you fast forwarded through you. You skipped around some of this stuff. (laughs) Mr. Werewolf Ninja Philosopher. Let's walk around the streets of New York for like three minutes with really cool jazz music looking at streets. That's a 72 minute movie. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't. The length doesn't matter. It's what you do with it that counts. At least that's what I read in the bathroom once. I probably watched uh, three hours. Okay. I think I skipped over like an hour. Now here's those are are some of the long shots of uh, cinematography I liked. One Mm -hmm. of the problems I had with the structure this this slow cinema movie was that usually slow cinema gives you space for poetry, for discovering things that we don't usually see in the movies. This one seemed like it was really tightly plotted, plotted both script and cinematography wise. Mm-hmm. It didn't seem to have a lot of spontaneity, you know, some free moments like in Werewolf and some of the somewhat like Jarmish movies like Mystery Crane. So it kind of felt like, a, you know, kind of like what Hollywood would do if they had to make a uh, slow cinema movie. So I felt I like, I don't know where you're getting that from. I mean, sure. this this does this does not feel anything like a Hollywood film to me, um, partially because of the subject matter. And also, I mean, they take like, yeah, this is not a, a commercial film. It does. It definitely has an independent spirit to it. Not that yeah, it would. The cinematography to me felt like it was really well planned, maybe too well planned so that it leaves out some of the magic that comes into movies. And some of his other movies are different. Well, I mean, like, uh, but help me out with like, give me some examples here. Well, you have uh, dolly track shots that like when they're uh, drinking on that ridge, there's a, early in the movie, maybe 20, 30 minutes in, there's a group of the- you know, Oh yeah, the, 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 the law students, yeah. Right, right, so there's a dolly track shot that uh, goes parallel to the action, right? Mm-hmm. And that kind of shot really has to be pre-planned as to what the when the, where the camera is going to be, where what the people are going to do at what what point, and rehearsed over and over before they can do it. As opposed to a uh, slow cinema shot where the camera is set in one area and we watch the environment. People come in, they do something, they have freedom to change things up then they move away as in uh, right but that but, right but that's not this kind of a scene i mean the whole point of that scene is to establish that they're you know drinking on a bridge and they're having a conversation i mean right. if it were about something else i don't think that the, and the shot was kind of misaligned but i think for what they were trying to accomplish in that scene it worked you know perfectly fine i think uh, all cinematography i think all of the cinematography and uh, it's you know cinematography is beautiful looking but I think it's too tightly planned out for uh, for a uh, slow cinema movie for my liking. I like uh, you know cinematography that's more open ended. Okay, but I mean that comes back to personal preference, and that's fine. Sure. Yeah. Um, I would say that there was some there were some shots that I thought were annoying because I feel like they were planned out, but planned out to film things that didn't really have a purpose. Got and I, I filed a lot of stuff into my mental bank because I'm like, okay, I'm watching uh, what's I, Joaquin, who's mm-hmm. our he's he's our character who was wrongfully imprisoned right. uh, early. Oh, but, we forgot ahead. to mention that this is based on another. I think another reason why this had this might have been problematic is 
this is for me. This is based on crime and punishment. Um, classic, you know. Oh, novel. by Dostoevsky. I wow, I did not know that. I've I've not read Crime and Punishment. <laughs> it's on my list. <laughs> I think I had to read it uh, like in high school or whatever. But anyway, so that limits that 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 limits you know the kind of characters and the kind of story. So the half of the movie, like the first, you know, not a half, but like the first 90 minutes or so is kind of straight out of Crime and Punishment. I don't know if they had, um, in Crime and Punishment, a guy gets away with murder, then he spent, then he goes mad as he, you know, complains about God and, you know, injustice, how things are set up in the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it had a innocent man who takes the fall. So I think that's something that Diaz added. So, when you're starting with that source material, the kind of Philippine, the kind of the Philippines and the society that we see are heavily affected to support that thesis, right? So it's not like uh, just Lab Diaz making a movie about the Philippines. Well, I mean, here's the thing: is it an adaptation of Crime and Punishment, or is it inspired by Crime and Punishment? Because those are two different, two different things. They, they, it is marketed as an adaptation. Okay. Yeah, again, I can't speak to that because I haven't read Crime and Punishment, but and so I can't really speak to whether or not he falsified things about Filipino culture to mold it to the Crime and Punishment mold, because that could be, you know, interesting and sort of problematic in its own right. But I don't you know, think so. I, I, both are both, you know, both cultures are re very religious, the okay. culture in Crime and Punishment and the culture in the Philippines. Okay, so I guess what what is your criticism then of telling crime and punishment in the modern day context, perhaps to say something about modern Filipino society and justice system? It leaves out a ton of stuff that could be put in the movie from uh, contemporary Philippines life that doesn't line up with a crime and punishment adaptation. Like we didn't really have a lot of comedy, a lot of light characters, a lot of absurdist humor, and that exist in like every country in this, in, uh, in Norte. Norte, to me, it seems like an adaptation of Crime and Punishment. Right, but I mean, but you could say that about every movie. Every movie has to leave out certain elements of the societies in which they take place in order to tell a story. I mean, you could say Unless... that, you, you could say that a comedy leaves out all the, you know, the drama and the despair of, you know, downcast people in order to focus on, you know, goofy clown antics and romance. Sure. Uh, so I, I just, I'm trying to figure out your, I'm trying to understand your criticism here. It, so let's say uh, DS wanted to make a four hour movie in modern day Philippines about a crime, right? Let's say he didn't use crime and punishment as his starting point. Mm -hmm. So he could have, uh, uh, in that scenario, I think he would have been free to add in different flavors of the Philippines besides the poor guy who can get out of jail for a while and the intellectual wealthy people who are talking about things but they're they're really not doing anything about any massive change massive positive changes mm -hmm. the Filipino the the Philippines uh, society has a history of rebellion against colonialism, has a history of uh, attempting to, you know, fix the uh, problems that have come up because of that, has a history of dictators and resisting dictatorships. So there is a lot of positive material in the Philippines culture that are not really shown at all in Norte. And well, but, but another again- problem, Another problem I have with La Diaz is, he takes a very socialist political stance uh, to his art, about his art and about history. So uh, he, his movies leave out. I mean, I think they're almost always about how messed up the Philippines is. Mm -hmm. Let me think. I can't think of uh, even, even the musical that he did. So, his general worldview, heavily influenced by socialist politics, mm -hmm. is a very bleak, negative one about the Philippines. 
I mean, you know, it's, they've had dictators, they've had major problems, but that's not, I mean, I have some relatives who are married to people from the Philippines and I've done research about the country. Um, so, but that's not all of it. And they have, they have Hollywood style movies, they have comedy, they have, you know, businesses, they have a famous boxer. So uh, his take on the Philippines is a very narrow take. And uh, that came, so, uh, so using crime and punishment, I think for him is an ideal vehicle. For me as an audience member, I would have liked to have seen more diversity of ideas, politics, uh, life experience, and uh, you know, the, the, you know the, the society can't uh, function forever, or function for a long time without reformers, without people doing positive things. We didn't really see anything like that in the movie. Well, I, 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 well, I disagree, and, and we'll, we'll get into that, but getting back to, I mean, but what you're saying is, I mean, it's still, I think it's an odd critique, because yes, he, did, he didn't make that, he didn't make the kind of movie you want to see, right. and, and I have not, I'm not familiar with his other filmography, so maybe he does make movies with a similar theme or political bent or even bleakness. But you could say the same thing to a large extent. I mean, not so much now because he's certainly branched out. But you know, Martin Scorsese made yeah. a lot of movies about you know New York Italians that you know were very light on comedy. You could look at you know Francis Ford Coppola with The Godfather. Basically, any of the the big filmmakers yeah. focusing on Italian culture, they were you know they did not have a lot of positive things to say about Italian culture or you know American politics, uh, government, religion. But yeah, I'm not a huge fan of those movies. Well, okay, but again, we're getting back to taste, sure, and that's and that's fine. Yeah. But I, you know, I'm just I'm trying to find like we're a talking about what we liked about the movie, right? Individual taste, right? I'm just trying to, but I don't want to confuse the idea of a quality argument about the film versus a taste argument. Um, no, taste ultimately determines quality in mm, art. It can, it can, it does. Well, no, look, we've had this discussion about how, you know, I say that there are, you know, objectively bad movies. And you've told me that, you know, anytime someone works hard and puts a, you know, good Internet. effort into a film that it, it yeah, confers some kind of a quality onto that art. And we've had, we've had that argument before and we're kind of no, having no, no, it I'm now. I'm saying objective, objective good or bad doesn't really exist in the arts. There, it could, ex it, it could exist in architecture or plumbing, but art is, uh, or entertainment, right? Art entertainment, um, very narrow, given time period, what's popular, what people are used to. Now, if I'm, if I'm a fan, like, you know, I love most Jarmusch movies, right? I'm a fan of his take on the world and, or what he shows in his movies. Now, if, if, I, if my politics and worldview were similar to Diaz's or what he shows in the movies, I may have loved this movie. I mean, it's technically a well-made movie, as I think we both agree on that. Yeah, but here's the thing. I, I vehemently disagree with the politics, with, you know, Diaz's politics as ex expressed in this film. And right. I still love the movie. I can separate my own personal, you know, political stances from the art that I enjoy. And I want to get to this point of disagreement. Um, what you're talking about, the Filipino uh, history of, you know, rebellion, um, and, you know, uh, dictatorships and things that I think is sort of the centerpiece of this movie. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the idea. It's called the end, you know, Norte, the end of history. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems with the main, you know, the, the main character we've kind of danced around here uh, is a character named Fabian played by uh, Sid Lucero. He is a lost good actor in the movie. Good actor. Oh, oh, yeah. Very good. I mean, the, the performances, I think, in this movie are, are really, the, the, you know, they stand out. Um, I think I don't think there's a dud in the bunch, really. Yeah, so but, I agree, it's a technically well-made movie. Mm -hmm. But I agree, it's technically a well-made movie. Sure. But he drops out of law school. It's established that he had one year left to go, but he was getting really consumed by you know socialist politics and had a really angry view of the world. He hangs out with this. You know, we open up uh, in this cafe where he's sort of ranting about the unfairness of it all. It's very much like a an early twenties you know, burn the whole system down kind of, you mm -hmm. know, pseudo anarchist, uh, you know, take on things. You know, it's it's cute, but it's not practical. It's right. it's fiery and passionate, but not, you know, workable. Yeah. Uh, but he 
for as much as he hates capitalism, uh, he's still like borrowing money from people. Uh, he's still he's still hawking stuff. He's still you know it's it's sort of like the whole like socialist uh, dream. It's like well you know how are you gonna you know pay for that the place you need to live? Well in the utopia no one will have to pay for money. Well yeah but you don't live in that utopia right now. You, you know right. give me my rent. Yeah, um, that's like my joke about socialist and decapitalist filmmakers. I'm like <laughs> listen if you're a filmmaker you're participating in America in America you're a capitalist in yes. practice because right. you can't film is too expensive to be an anti-capitalist art in America right so but that's the that's the whole thing is he is sort of uh he has this dream of you know being the kind of rebellious force to upturn everything and as he says if there's something bad kill it uh, it's it's you know if you want to go for the mainstream argument it's Anakin Skywalker in Attack of the Clones talking to Padme saying well if I ruled the universe you know I would just like stamp out all the bad stuff and she said well wouldn't that make you a dictator and he's like but I'd be a good guy uh, <laughs> and and his friends to his credit his other law school friends uh, they you know they humor him they talk oh, him I, I I really like that one scene about three hours in. <laughs> <laughs> when him and his buddies are sitting around on a table and he's like this other guy is innocent and he and they ask him how are you put so passionately how do you know he's, so he makes sort of a legal argument but he doesn't tell him that he killed the you know the, he did the murder right and <laughs> that, but that but that that's scene, a scene that's right beautiful. it is and that's also sort of the i i I kind of struggled with this movie because I couldn't figure out if it was a religious positive or a spirituality positive film or a spiritual religious negative film. And I came down on the side that it's a religious spiritual negative film, um, not oh, necessarily. DS, the, hmm? DS has said that he doesn't like how, and I think some characters say this in the movie, he doesn't like how in the Philippines, uh, there's a cultural habit of, you know, turning to religion, letting the letting God or letting divine justice eventually solve things, which never happens. So he he has a negative take on religiosity in the Philippines. Right, and and there's almost a, a cruelty to it, uh, to the way that he treats these characters. Um, but I will say that there are kind of glimpses of hope. It's not the idea yeah. that God is angry towards people. It's not that he doesn't, it, it's sort of almost like he, it's like there is sort of a divine force. Maybe he gets bored and he decides to mess with people. Maybe he's an absentee landlord, as Pacino said in The Devil's, uh, the Devil's Advocate. But there, it's not a completely bleak picture. There's some ambiguity that if you look at it from the right angle, suggests a positive outcome for some of these characters. Now, I want to say that Fabian, to set this all up, uh, he's sort of in hawk to the local uh, money pawn lender. money lender, um, uh, Madame Magda, uh, as she's called, um, and she has kind of influence throughout this entire uh, village. Uh, the the main female character Eliza, played by Angeli Bayani, is a single. Uh, well, she's not a single mother yet, but uh, she's got a husband. Uh, named Joaquin, as we kind of mentioned before. Uh, he's had some kind of a leg injury as the movie opens. But I, I was one thing I want to sidetrack and mention, I met, uh, talked earlier about the cinematography and I was kind of annoyed. There's a scene, it's kind of emblematic of a few things we see in this movie, of Joaquin, he's standing in his living room or his bedroom, just like on the crutches, looking out the window for like a minute and a half. Mm -hmm. And I filed that away. I'm like, okay, this means something. <laughs> At the end, it doesn't really i mean i might need to watch the movie again just to see if it kind of circles back but there are a few of those scenes where it's like this navel gazing like what are we looking at here right yeah. um so that you know criticism aside but joaquin and eliza have a struggling you know restaurant they're trying to get up uh it's not working out they're in severe debt to madame magda they're constantly trying to sell stuff and having her come to their restaurant in their house to say hey you want these plates how much will you give us for these plates um, at one point, Eliza hawks what it may be their wedding ring or a very significant, you know, ring for $500. Um, Joaquin goes separately to try and get the ring back. 
And Magda is like, look, you owe me a lot of money. Go out and get me like half the money you owe me by noon and you can have the ring back or something like that. And he flips out because he's completely desperate and he strangles her, like mm -hmm. jumps over the desk and just like attacks her. And it's very vicious. It's one of several like spontaneous outbreaks of violence in this movie. Uh, he then goes on the run. He goes into hiding. And later, uh, Fabian pays a visit to Madame Magda at night. And she goes to get, I think she was holding his bank card or credit card or something as collateral. She goes upstairs to get it. He waits a minute at the door and then follows her with a, a knife and Brutal killer. cuts her up. Yeah, it's, it's bad. It's, it's all off screen, fortunately, but the sounds and the, the screaming is, is brutal. But Magda's teenage daughter, whom Fabian had been sitting with at the desk like a few hours earlier, like while she was doing her homework, uh, kind of having a cordial relationship, he flips out, runs into her bedroom once he realizes he's been caught and stabs her to death. And then he yeah, you know, that, makes- That murder is from Crime and Punishment. Okay. Um, Including killing the bystander. Okay. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking because it's a 13 year old girl or whatever it is. Um, so eventually, because we come to find out because of the attack earlier in the day with Joaquin or the day before, uh, he becomes the number one suspects the, the cop round cops round him up and he essentially gets sent to jail for life. Um, meanwhile, Fabian gets away with it. He skips town and goes to Manila to kind of, you know, hide out and deal with his you know, trauma, because it's not like he's a cold blooded killer. He is a human being who commits an unspeakable act. And that, you know, works its way through his entire body. He's screaming, he's crying, he's frothing, he's like rocking himself to sleep and all that stuff. He's gone mad. He, yeah, he's gone crazy. Yeah. But through and, you know, Joaquin goes to jail, we get to see a very vivid portrait of his jail life. One of the things that I thought was kind of a genius bit of this film is when I say these, it's punctuated by these moments of violence. For a long time, we see him in prison. He sort of makes friends, reluctant friends, people who are sort of like, you know, lifers who are in there for longer than he has been kind of saying, look, get used to this. This is your reality. But then they're also like doing arts and crafts. It doesn't look like you when you see an American movie, like these gray cells and you're in there with like serial rapists. These are almost like dorms with like random bits of ephemera strewn about and they seem pretty spacey. But on Christmas, there is a scene in a cell where there's like six or eight guys in there. And this one older gentleman, uh, uh, Mr. Walk Walk, I think, mm -hmm. Sir Walk Walk, gets up and he starts singing Oh Holy Night. And one of the inmates, he thinks, rolls his eyes at him. And Sir Walk Walk goes crazy and beats the shit out yeah. of this guy in the yeah. cell. And it goes on for minutes. It's not like watching a guy on crutches look out the window. This is minutes of a brutal beating where That's it's like awesome. happening right up on the camera. Yeah. And even, um, you know, Joaquin tries to intervene and help the guy. And then Wok Wok says, you get, you sit back down on the bunk. I'm not, <laughs> I'll deal with you later. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it, you get this idea of prison, like, oh, maybe it's not that bad. And I'm sitting here as an American thinking, oh, is this a cultural kind of a thing where it's like just guys who didn't really do much hanging out and, you know, <laughs> bonding and it's kind of nice. No, it's, it's a hell hole. Yeah. Uh, so through a course of events, Fabian, uh, his guilty conscience gets the best of him. He goes back home, uh, sells some stuff, gives sort of a secret donation to Eliza to get her family back, you know, right. I'm jumping over a whole bunch of stuff. Cause again, it's four hours long. Yeah. He goes and reconnects with his old law school friends who he had, you know, strictly walked out on before he left town, you know, said, you're no longer my friends. I hate all of you. You're, you're wasting your lives. Right. But he presents them the legal case and says, look, this guy is innocent. Don't ask me how I know, but here's the case. Look into it. Yeah, now, I like that scene. yeah, but this is what I'm getting to. There's so much bleakness mm -hmm. and it turns out that Fabian, you think he's turning a corner, but the yeah. worst of his character is yet to come. Yes. Don't tell, don't tell everything. Let I won't. I, well, it, the, the movie's like almost nine years old, but yeah, I will, I will say. Some there, people won't watch it because of the show. Well, there is, let's just say Fabian is not done with committing unspeakable acts. Yes. The first of which is, oh my God. The second I, of which. I, I did like that one character 
I, uh, his sister Hoda. was running a successful uh, plantation or whatever. So that that's a nice character. That's a nice character, but that also gets that gets back to Lav Diaz's from what you're telling me idea about religion and spirituality because she's yes. very religious. Um, and given how things end up for her, and I'm not going to say you, yeah. you might yes. think, oh well, she just gets killed. Uh, I'm not going to say if she does or not, but it's not exactly what you think. In some right. senses, it's worse. Uh, she throughout is turning to God, turning to, you know, she's praying, she's trying to see the best in people. And it's almost like the, the universe spits back in her face. Mm -hmm. um, but for as much as you think Fabian is like, well, at, at any moment, he's going to straighten up or turn the corner or get some kind of a cosmic justice. Uh, it is a very bleak ending. But I will say the way that Joaquin and his, you know, kind of situation ends up, you mentioned he gets out of prison Let's talk about that, because I don't think he did. I thought he did, and reunited with his family. And then something happened to him towards the end. Well, here's the thing. I don't think he, I don't think he got out of prison, because, and I thought he did, but Diaz does this. Well, I don't know, but it's, it gets to a, a bit of dialogue, which we'll touch on. But I thought he got out, too. But Diaz does this a couple of times in the film, where he shows you something or a character doing something, and then kind of, turns it around sort of like that prison scene that i mentioned with the with the yeah. oh holy night yeah i uh, thought he got out and then died in the car in the bus accident well we see that someone dies in the bus accident who's not him there's right. no emphasis on his body in the wreckage but there is emphasis on someone else hmm. when eliza goes to visit and it's the first time that she's been able to see him in four years because he's initially imprisoned locally but then he gets sent to a place that's like you know hours and hours away and the family is so poor they can't afford to go to visit so he's mm -hmm. like hearing word of his kids growing up and his wife and all that but so i thought that he was getting out too because he did not show up in his regular you know prison uniform he's not accompanied by guards but he does say the one of the last things he says to eliza is uh, I think I wrote this down here. It was very specific. Um, uh, da, 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 da. No, I didn't write it down. Um, but he does say, uh, tell the kids something like, you know, I love, huh? Maybe, maybe what we saw was a visit, right? Because he says something like, tell the kids, I love them or tell them. I wish I could see them or something like that. And later on, we do see Joaquin, lying on a bed and then levitating it's the one like truly dreamlike sequence we get in the film aside from some bizarre omniscient uh you know possibly spiritual stuff of the camera floating over a beach and through a neighborhood with the constant sounds of waves crashing even when we go to the jungle or through the prison uh so i'm i'm pretty sure that he survived and that's sort of the tragedy is his family did not well, his what? <laughs> you almost maybe say it. <laughs> Some of his family survives, but he's still locked up. Now, the bit of hope is that because I had assumed when we saw them together, as you did, that he got out, that the appeal that Fabian had set into motion with those other lawyers, that maybe that had worked out. Now, it could be that in the future it will work out because sometimes these things take years to work their way through the court system. But when he gets out, what is he going to go back to? Mm hmm. It's not what he, you know, had hoped for sure. Right. right. It's a very so, sad movie, but it's it's hopeful in pockets. Yeah, uh, yeah. Of course, I, I saw that, and it's well made technically. But um, the problem I have with the, uh, you know, political filmmaking, which Love Diaz has identified, he himself has identified his film are political. His films are political acts. Mm -hmm. So uh, is that unlike Scorsese and a lot of American filmmakers who are less political about, I mean, they acknowledge what they're doing is art and entertainment as opposed to using a movie to express a political viewpoint. Uh, political filmmaking, uh, whenever I've seen it, is limited. It organizes uh, the story to make a point. And I guess the point in this movie is that the Philippines is severely messed up <laughs> and, and, the, and people are not making the right choices and they're making the wrong choices. So right, but, that limits what you can show and that's one of my problems with it. But, but here's the thing is for a, you know, for a filmmaker who professes to be you know, a political filmmaker, 
if his worldview is a socialist worldview, this is not the film to underscore his point. I feel like it's a very anti-socialist uh, message because the character who in the film who represents that mm -hmm. goes insane, becomes a murderer, and in some cases worse, and mm -hmm. ends up just you know kind of this aimless drifter at the end. Whereas the people who were constantly telling him, look, things are not that bad, you know, as you think they are. And if you really want to make a change, then finish law school and join us in helping to, you know, work through the legal system to make things better and do mm -hmm. things like get your, you know, get this acquaintance off of this bogus, you know, murder charge. Yeah. So, so that's the know, thing. I think, I think a true socialist movie would have been like, you know, all the, the the lawyers get rounded up by the new world government that uh, Fabian creates and executed to prove that capitalism is dead. Right. Well, uh, the end of history title comes from the book, The End of History and Land, Last Man by Francis Fukuyama, which says that, which that book became popular in the 80s, I think, or 90s, mm. 90s probably which says that democratic capitalism, countries that are democratic and capitalist, that is the final stage that any, that all, all countries will eventually get through after taking detours to communism, whatever, whatever, that this, that's, the, that's sort of the end point in political history. That, uh, so Lav Diaz used that title to say, and he said this in an interview, that might be the case for the US and some Western countries, but end of history, success of, the success of capitalism and democracy has not worked out well for the Philippines. He said that, I don't, I don't exactly know what that, how that translates to the movie, but that's well, where the title comes from. Well, and it's interesting because it's something I, I'm glad you mentioned that because I know we're kind of over time here, but uh, one of the central themes, I don't know if this goes back to Dostoevsky or, what but there is a beautiful parallel and kind of a, a it's beautiful but it's also really dark that is revealed in the middle of the film because early on uh joaquin and eliza are talking about their you know their ill fortunes and how they had made the or maybe it was eliza talking to her sister uh about how eliza and joaquin had made the decision early on that they were going to not do what their parents did because their their parents left to go to uh, you know other places to make their fortunes and you know send money back to you know the Philippines to the and essentially raising kind of like this disconnected bourgeoisie you know class it's it's sort of like uh, implied that that's what you know Madame Magda you know possibly comes from old money mm -hmm. but they wanted to be there for their kids and live the kind of hard life to come up you know have a family with those kind of values. The parallel to that comes with Fabian and Hoda, whose parents did become fabulously wealthy working in America and Europe, you know, mm -hmm. democratic capitalist societies that sent the money back to the Philippines. But it's like, well, once you get that money, what what do you do with it? You know, there's mm -hmm. sort of like this disconnect there. You can say that, you know, because the Philippines is a capitalist society because everything kind of runs on money. Politics mm -hmm. is another thing. But if you want to work to change a broken system, there are avenues to do that, especially if you have money. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying that these parallels of these families, they keep kind of colliding with each other, even though there's never like a formal meeting between all the people whose lives are being you know, affected by the events of the other mm -hmm. uh, that just speak thematically to some greater ideas I thought was really you know, cool. Awesome. So we have, I have thumbs down on this movie. You have thumbs up. That's good. Makes for a good show. I still don't know how you have thumbs down on this movie. And let me ask you this. You as said you person, watched. As, a, as someone who did, did I enjoy the movie or not? I did not enjoy it. That's why it's thumbs down. All right. I, I don't like know. Like going to a restaurant and eating a meal. Was it good or was it not? Well, but that's the and thing. It's like, why, well, why well but no, here's the difference. You can go to a restaurant and have a perfectly prepared meal. Sure. But it's something that you don't happen to like. Right. You could have you. Someone could say, "Hey, have you ever had sushi before?" No. Oh well, let's go to this, you know, Michelin star sushi restaurant, and the world's best sushi chef presents you yes. his top dish, and yeah. you eat and say, "I don't like this. It's not a bad meal. You right. just didn't like it." Yeah. So I mean, 
So that's that's a valid response to anything. Like you didn't like slow cinema movies a couple of years ago, then you learned about them. Now you now you like a lot of them. So uh, it that's doesn't mean the the current Ian is wrong and the past Ian is well. Uh, but I guess I guess you are. I guess the the thumbs down just seems a bit harsh to me because you're acknowledging that you know the performances has, has are good it's well made you just didn't happen to respond to the story but that's not a value judgment necessarily about the story itself it's the way that you responded to it is that right yeah i'm saying for me it's thumbs okay. down. all right <laughs> that's all i'm saying that uh, uh you know art and entertainment whether it's good or not ultimately depends on i mean you can say it's good for cinematography you can say it's good as a historical thing you could say the career of Love Diaz is good because it, it inspires other filmmakers because he found a unique way of making movies. But as an audience member, ultimately you have to decide, did you enjoy the piece or did you not? I didn't enjoy the piece for the reasons that I mentioned, but you know, people should see it. There's a lot, there's some good stuff in there and there's uh, some good stuff tied to the movie, History of Philippines and the career of Love Diaz. People should, people should look at all that. Yeah, I just when when you when you give the thumbs down and then you still and you say but people should go see it. It's just it's sort of a mixed message. It's not thumbs down for my personal enjoyment, but other people might dig it. Same mm. uh, the same the similar to the reaction uh, in in some ways that you have to you had to Godard's uh, goodbye to language. You didn't like it, but he's an important filmmaker and his movies. Right, but I wouldn't. Things. But here's the thing: I wouldn't necessarily recommend that people watch that movie. Got it. No, I think. If you know what, if you're okay with the bleak story, uh, and that's that, and you think you might enjoy it, then this is a good movie too. I mean, it's a sort of a morality play. You know, if, if that's the kind of thing you want to see, if, and especially if you enjoyed uh, *Crime and Punishment*, this might be the thing for you. Mm. This is you are personally who's 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 working on slow romance distribution. This is a thumbs down. Okay. Um, but still, you know, people who are, who like that kind of movies might, might enjoy it. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I will say I, <laughs> I ended up buying this movie because of my schedule. I mentioned, I didn't have time to sit down and watch a four hour and 10 minute anything this week. So, uh, right. instead of renting it and paying, you know, $3 for every two day or every couple of days <laughs> on Amazon, I just bought it off of voodoo for 10 bucks. And like I gotta awesome. say, I, I was, I was very happy with my purchase. I, awesome. it's gonna be a while before I watch this again, because yikes, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it was, it was fun. Thumbs up for me. Um, good, but good. no, I, I, you know, I'm glad that you recommended this i would be fascinated to talk you know sometime next year about a lot diaz movie that you do recommend even if it's you know eight hours long <laughs> Got it. Well, so and maybe far, even something that's and maybe even something that's different from this you know yeah, so far the only love diaz movie that i enjoyed was uh actually i have to look back at my notes and maybe i should watch them all in full because of the length like the seven eight hour movies i did i skipped through some part many parts because they're like that shot of the guy watching the window. A lot of these movies are made up of a lot of the similar shots. I, in, a, in a two hour mo slow cinema movie, you have the patient, you have the time to see if it makes any sense. In an eight hour movie, you know, it's a little difficult, but uh, yeah, we'll take a look. Okay. And, uh, yeah, we could do a, a, you know, a review of Love Diaz as a career. Uh, it's interesting that he is able to keep making these movies and there's an audience, there's the institutional, you know, film festivals and some grants organization that keeps supporting him. He even has actual fans. So uh, that's awesome. Are they paying, are they using capital to pay for his movies? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, well, thank you again for, uh, for, I mean, this is, this is our year end indie that's scene. Right. Wow, that's man, right. 2021, it's, it's over. So we're going to be back. Uh, 2022. Yeah, 2022. With, wow. Uh, with uh, owner owner Tuchel or Tuchel or I don't know how he pronounces his last name. Owner Tuchel is what I call him. <laughs> that uh, filmmakers uh, will discuss a bunch of his movies. He's an exciting filmmaker from New York. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to talk about him. And thanks for spoiling the big January show. Well, no, sorry, no, sorry. Uh, but uh, no, that. Yeah, well, we'll be back uh, next month and we got a whole another year. The year of <laughs> the Secret Society for Slow Romance begins. Uh, right. So and then 
I may have an update on slow romance. Uh, well, I'll definitely have an update on slow romance distribution. People may be able to see it on January 1st at slowromancemovie.com. Yeah. And, you know, I'll post like updates, you know, share stuff out as soon as, you know, I know something I can share. So, uh, awesome. yeah. Anyway, again, thanks. I know we didn't agree, disagree. I, I know we didn't agree on this movie, but I had a lot of fun talking well, it think, through with you. Yeah, it was really, yeah, really fun. I some things. I think, you know, it's just different taste. Uh, overall, it's, you know, it was a good thing to watch. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, but definitely not a holiday film, although no, there's a lot of red in it. Um, but <laughs> not an upbeat movie. Not yeah. an upbeat Sajua type movie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Well, thank you very much. Uh, happy holidays, and I'll I'll talk to you soon. And uh, use the legal system. Don't take the matters into your own hands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> de definitely. That's 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 sage advice. <laughs> All right. Take care, man. Bye. See you.